So good morning from the Subscribe HQ. I'm Tim. We've got Hannah and Hannah with us as well on the <laughs> webinar. I'm just going to let you all join up. If you've managed to join, please do type in the chat console. If you go to the bottom into the chat, type in where you're, where you're calling in from. Let us know your name and you know where you're, what council you're from. It'd be great. I can, I can find the chat. Great, so we've got uh, Bernard, Kathy, welcome, Judy, welcome Judy, Jan, Julie, Kelly, Swanson Moy, hi Kelly, nice to see you again. But Pauline, Alan, morning Alan, Gillian, morning, Jai Jane, oh gosh, I can't keep up. Yeah, it's going too Even quickly. special glasses on. Julie, morning, hi Matt, morning Dan, Brandy, Whole Beach, not too far from us. Hi Joe from Horton, hi Dan from Christchurch, Fiona, Fantastic. Morning all. Great, so fantastic. You guys have found the, um, the chat console. I guess you, everyone's used to using Zoom, I think, for council meetings and all that sort of stuff. Um, I'm hoping we won't have a Jackie Weaver moment this morning. So uh, this is a di as you might see, it's a different type of webinar. Actually, it can just see myself, Hannah, um, and Hannah. And uh, um, the controls are slightly different. What we'll do at the end, if you want to ask a question, we'll bring you in for audio only. You can come in and ask a question. So morning, everybody. We'll just give it a couple more minutes whilst um, the last kind of people join up. We'll give it a couple of minutes and they'll come in. Um, so we're actually, we're based in Norfolk, East Coast. Uh, I guess like the rest of you, we're in massive lockdown. I'm the only one in the office. It's the first time I've been in the office for quite a while. Um, we've got here Hannah Driver, if you could give us a wave, our in-house accountant extraordinaire who's going to be doing a presentation this morning um, she's our brain box behind scribe um, i also got hannah hignett who's our head of marketing she's kind of master master of controls this morning making sure everything goes uh, goes well and uh, yeah we are recording the webinar um so you better get a copy of that afterwards and uh, yeah so right i think everyone looks like everyone's in everyone from norfolk morning mo Excellent. So you'll see in Zoom at the bottom, there's different controls. I hope you can see uh, the raised hand. You guys can see raised hand. But if you want to ask a question, the best, the best way is to raise your hand or just add, ask it in the chat console. I'm just going to share my screen now and go through today's agenda. So today's um, training is all about year end. Secret to mastering year, mastering year end for town and parish councils. So it's year end. We're just coming out of lockdown. It's stressful time of year. Everything kind of lands. Um, coming into spring, which is nice. You can see the sun is starting to shine, but it is a stressful time of year for clerks and getting everything correct. So the idea today is that Hannah will give you a format to make that year end as simple as possible. It's not going to be scribe specific. It's going to be just a general year end tips, how to get things right. He's going to run through the presentation will last 30 40 minutes um, and then within that if you have any questions just put them in the chat console uh, other hannah will be taking them down and then afterwards in the q a we'll bring you in put the question up on the screen you can ask your question and hannah will do her best to answer it so that's the bulk of the the, the, the day today it's all about helping you get through year end and and being organized and kind of the, um, what we're seeing with our customers is that uh, People who are organized and got their reconciliations right, do things in advance, it tends to go smoothly. So um, we're also gonna to talk to you about, uh, just for a few minutes at the end, what Scribe does, you know, our, our accounting system online, our new booking system and our telemetry system, that's literally gonna take five minutes. Um, so I know you're here to learn about year end and, and uh, learn about that rather than be sold to by us. Um, and at the end, we've got a Scribe gin competition. And the way that works is uh, we'll do this Wheel of Fortune and We'll see how it works at the end. It's quite fun. There'll be a bottle of scribe gin and I'm going to somebody at the end of this. So um, before we sort of go into the presentation, I just want to talk to you about uh, um, our view on scribe and what we're here to do. So we're, we're all about helping town and parish councils get their systems in place so they can focus on the things that make a difference to your communities. So we, we believe that by putting in really good um, software as a service, SaaS systems, um, that clerks and councillors can spend more time working on community projects and things that are important to them and their community rather than spending time on admin, lost numbers, lost reports, um, compliance, GDPR, and so on. So that's what we're here all about. And part of that is that 
we're doing a series of these sort of uh, free training uh, programs, which are some, you know, which are invite for our customers invited to, but also anyone's invited to, just to try and sh um, share the ideas. And part of that is that we want to connect clerks together so you can help each other. I know some of you are already in our Facebook group, but we've got a Facebook group called the Clarks Community, which I will show you quickly. Council Clarks Community. Hope you can see that. So Hannah, would you mind just posting up the URL to that? Yeah, Maybe. sure, I'll pop it up now. Within here, there's, I think we've got, yeah, 948 members. And you can quickly see here without sort of going into too much detail. This is a great place that you can all help each other. So if you've got any questions, you just don't know who to ask. If you come into here, ask the question, then other clerks come in and help. And you can see that everything gets answered. Um, not always the answer that you want, um, but everything does get answered. We're also there to answer it, but actually this is all about the arts community. So if you want to join up, please just follow the link and there's some questions just to check that you're a clerk and then come in and help and ask questions, answer questions and fantastic. Uh, let me just check. I think that is, um, yeah, I think we're good to go. So in that case, I'm going to stop sharing my screen and hand over to our accountant, Hannah. Thank you. Okay, I'm just going to share my screen now. So hopefully you can all see that. <clears throat> there we go. So the secrets of mastering year-end town and parish councils, as Kim mentioned. So I've split this down into four sections for today. The first one, just to look at what you can be doing now to prepare um, for your end, to get yourself up to date, ahead of yourself before 1st of April comes along. Then we can look at the AGAR, so obviously this is the big part, the actual completing of the year end account to complete the AGAR, etc. along with that, so big section on that. And then looking at once you've done that, what do you then do with regards to signing it off, meetings, publishing the information, etc. where do you send it to? to? And then a little bit at the end, just looking ahead to the new financial year as well. Okay, so as I mentioned then, I want to start today just talking a little bit about preparing for year end and what you can be doing now um, to look ahead to it. Okay, so I know, as Tim mentioned, it's quite a stressful time, lots to do, lots of extra to think about. Um, obviously, if you've got a big work pressure, not too many hours in the day to get everything done. This is just additional work as well. And also stressful because you're only doing it um, once a year, easy to forget exactly what you need to do and what format, etc. So it can be quite stressful. So the first thing I want to therefore mention is about expecting the additional work involved and factoring this in to your workload or your schedule. Appreciate that yes, it is going to take longer, that you do need to set some time um, to do that factor it into your schedule the best you can if you can set aside some specific time or hours to do it rather than just trying to fit it into a day-to-day -day, then that would be a nice approach to help you really focus on it secondly i think it's really important to have up-to-date and accurate data if you've been to one of our scribe events before seen me talking about it you know this is my favorite thing to go on about i'm um, talking about being up to date getting it all in there so if you're sitting there at the moment and you've got a few month data you've not got on you're not up to date then try and find some time to do that because if you then get to the end of the year first of april all your data's on it's there you're in a really good position to get started so ensure your data is accurately recorded in the cash book get it on there make sure it's accurate make sure you've got your audit trail your paper trail behind it your monthly bank reconciliations get them up to date so that will reduce your workload at year end if you haven't done one for a few months get them up to date we're nearly at the end of february so you can get that one done so at the end of the year you've only got march to be dealing with you've only got one month's worth of data if it doesn't reconcile to consider and also i've put there about collating data for your vat return or claim as possible obviously if your vat's registered and your claim ends at the end of march then you're going to have to do that but if you're just claiming it back, you don't have to, but I think it's a really good idea to do your VAT claim at the, at the year end point. Keep things neat, keep things in line with where you are. So if you haven't done one for a while or you know it's going to take you a while to get your data together, that's something else that you can be thinking about getting ahead and now. Okay. Another consideration is <clears throat> whether you need to do your year end accounts for the accounting statements in receipts and payments or income and expenditure particularly important if maybe you are a new clerk so you've not done this before or maybe you're a clerk that's moved between councils that use one approach and now is with the other one so you important to understand which approach you need to take and therefore what you need to do okay 
So if you're working in receipts and payments, that is for councils under £200,000 threshold, and that's the approach you need to take. If you're over the £200,000, then you need to do your year end account and income and expenditure, but that is for three consecutive years. So if you just find yourself, for example, this year, over the £200,000 threshold, because you've had an additional grant, a large grant come in, for example, but normally you'd be back under that £200,000 threshold, you don't need to move for income and expenditure. It's over £200,000 for three consecutive years. However, you can opt to use income and expenditure if you're a smaller council. So if you find yourself at a smaller council, you may already use income and expenditure. You may decide to. You may decide to move from income and expenditure to receipts and payments. Be clear on what approach you're taking. And also, it's really important to appreciate as well that if you're moving between approaches, you will need to restate your prior year. So whatever approach you use to um, do your current financial year in, you need to restate the prior year so that when you have your accounting statements, your current year and your prior year are using the same approach. So be aware of that because that's something that you can deal with now. So if you know that you're going to move to income and expenditure this year, you can be restating the prior year now in readiness. Okay. I'll talk a little bit more about what it means to be doing it in receipts and payments or income and expenditure in a little bit in, in, in the AGAR section itself. Okay, I've also put here about familiarising yourself with your instruction from the auditor and to understand what level of audit's required and what this means for you. So, for example, could your council be exempt from the audit, which is true if you're under £25,000 with some other criteria. So, again, if you've not done a, <coughs> a year end before or, again, you've moved maybe from a smaller council to a larger council, the way the audit needs to be done may be different, so make sure you're clear on what needs to happen. If you're exempt from audit, you still need to do the ACAR, you still need to do all the processes, you just don't send it off, so you don't think you're going to get away with it all, but just be clear on your understanding what you need to do. Okay, also it's a really good idea to refer to the JPAG Practitioner's Guide, because that supports the preparation of the ACAR, so if you haven't currently got a copy of that, make sure you do, you can get that from your auditor's website, and um, Google it, you can find it as well, and that's really helpful because it will break down each section of what you need to do at year end, each section of the AGAR, each part of the accounting statements and how they work and how they're calculated to help you fill it all in. And again, I've put about do you need to restate the prior year. So it's not just about moving between approaches from receipts and payments to income and expenditure or vice versa. You may have another requirement to restate the prior year. Maybe last year there was something wrong with it. Either you picked up an error that you now need to correct or your previous audit has stated that you need to restate the prior year or maybe your staff costs need restating. Hopefully you're aware that what can be included in staff costs in the accounting statements this year is different to previous years. Okay, they've removed some of the things that are now categorised as staff costs, such as homeworking, um, training mileage, <clears throat> things like that. And so not only do you need to make sure you don't include them in this current financial year, so for year end for this year, but you also need to restate box four for the prior year. I'll talk about that a little bit more later but these are all the sorts of things that you can be doing now so that when you get to the 1st of April what you're dealing with is just the current financial year and not having to worry about restating the prior year okay so that takes us on therefore to the agar so at this point if you've had the end of the financial year from the 1st of April if you're particularly keen and want to get started all your data is on your cash book it's accurate it's up to date it's reconciled to the bank you've done your bank reconciliations at the 31st of March you're ready to start thinking about the AGAR itself. Okay, so before we get to the numbers bit, I want to talk about the other sections that make it up. Okay, so firstly, we have the internal audit report. So that's the summarised conclusions from your internal audit to this report. And if nothing else, the report at least should allow you to answer the statements within this report within the AGAR. Okay. The idea is to consider the adequacy and effectiveness of the council's procedures and their internal controls, such as the way the precepts been calculated, the way the assets registered maintained, for example. Okay, so they'll be coming in to review these procedures, etc. in here. Carried out at least annually, and the scope and extent will depend on the council size and circumstance. So if you're a smaller council with not much going on, particularly quite a standard format for a council, then it's probably just an annual process. But if you're larger, you've got a bit more going on, you may have them coming out more regularly. Okay, these are taken directly from the AGAR and the things that they'll be looking at, and that will all be included within the report. 
So for you, although you need to arrange your internal auditor to come and be an external person to have a look at everything, this should just be a confirmation of those things that are happening throughout the financial year, all your procedures, your controls, your, they should be in place, you should be following them, and it should just allow these, hopefully these answers are going to be yes, if relevant to you, and it should just be working through that process. Okay. Similar situation with section one, which is the annual governance statement. This is quite similar to again, look at the effectiveness of your system of internal controls and you'll be giving yes or no responses to each statement. So a similar kind of thing about the procedures that you've got in place that you manage things appropriately that you follow the correct practices, okay? In order for you to answer yes to these statements, here they are, this is taken directly from the AGAR, you must have appropriate evidence to back them up. You don't have to provide it when you send it off, but if you were challenged or it was raised, you need to be able to prove that the yes answers come from you having proper procedures in place, limited evidence, for example. Okay. If you're not able to answer these to the yes, and you have to say no because you don't have the proper procedures in place or not things have not been done correctly, you would have to give more information as to why that is, what are the weaknesses, how are you going to address them going forward. Okay. So it's linked to the internal audit report. As you can see, six here talks about the adequate and effective system of internal audit. So obviously, if you've had an internal audit and it comes under the report, then it's given, instantly giving you an answer yes to six because you've had that done. So they're quite closely linked. And again, this should just be a review of the things that you're doing within the financial year, that you're working towards your procedures, your controls you've put in place, you're managing risk, et cetera, appropriately. And these are just hopefully at this point, just yes statements at this point. Okay. So then we come on to section two, the accounting statement. So this is the big part of the AGA, really. This is where you need to now collate all your data from your cash book, all your accounting information that you've got, and put it together to complete this. Okay. So in a moment, I'm going to talk about each of these boxes and the relevant things to think about when you're filling them in, things to consider. Okay. But firstly, I just want to look at the difference in the way you fill it in as to whether you're working in receipts and payments or income expenditure. Okay. So if you're in receipts and payments, you're probably a small account so under the £200,000 we talked about before. And receipts and payments means that you're recording your account literally at the point that you receive income where you pay money out. So it's based on the time in which these things happen, regardless of when the income or the payments relate to the case, about the time in which it happens. That means you can take your figures directly from the cash book. Once you've been in a situation where your cash book is up to date, it's reconciled to the end of March, you'll just be able to take those figures directly from your cash book and put them into the relevant boxes in, in the annual returns of the accounting statement section. Okay. If you're working in income expenditure, you've got a bit more work to do, okay, because you've got to take your data from your cash book, adjust it, and then you'll be able to use it. Okay, so the first thing you need to think about is that you're excluding VAT. When you're working in receipts and payments, you literally put the figures as they arrive arrive into the boxes, okay? In income expenditure, that is excluded because it will constitute a debtor or a credit, creditor, depending on whether you are, and it comes back to you, more likely it will be owed to you, okay? So that needs to be considered as an adjustment, and you also need to add further adjustments for your accruals or your prepayments. So the idea of income expenditure is that you're moving to base things on the time which they relate to, not which the time in which they happened. So once you get to the end of March, let's say you've had an invoice for repairing the boiler at the village hall, which blew up in March and it's been repaired. Okay, it's cost you £2,000. You've got the invoice, but because of the way the approval process and the pay subsequent payment of that invoice will take place, it's not going to happen until April. That would mean you need to put an accrual in for that, an adjustment, because you know you've had that work done, you've received the benefit of boiler being fixed in this example, and therefore it should appear in your accounts for this financial year, but you know it won't be paid till next year. So this means you need to go through and identify invoices that you've either received and you know won't be paid until the new financial year, or instances where you've had goods or services, you may not yet have had an invoice, and therefore you need to accrue for them, okay? The reverse of that is a prepayment where you may have paid for things up ahead that you're not gonna receive the benefit for until the new financial year. Let's say you had to pay for some building work to be done, but it's now not going to happen till April, but you've already paid for it. That's a prepayment because you've paid it before you've received the benefit of it. 
Therefore, you, at this point, you would reduce your payment figure as a prepayment, where you're accruing, you'll increase your payment figure, okay? You also need to consider the flip side of payments and think about income. So if you have other streams of income, such as maybe you hire out your hall, you have allotments, you also need to think about, do people owe you still at the end of the financial year? Or have you taken money from people that have not yet had the service yet? So let's think about hall hire. Maybe you've already had people paying you. Hopefully they're going to have birthday parties, weddings in the summer, and they paid for the hall hire up ahead. You've already received that income, but you've not provided them with their hire yet. Therefore, that's prepaid income, and you need to reduce your income figure shown in this current financial year because it relates to the new financial year. Flip side of that is if you've got people who maybe haven't paid you, you've got lots of allotment holders who haven't paid for this current financial year, that's accrued income, money you should have had, and therefore you should add it in. So it's all about thinking about what should have happened within this financial year, what should I have paid out, what money should I have had in, or have I paid out money that as of yet I don't have the benefit of, and adjusting for those things. The important thing here though, is to consider not only the materiality, but also the regularity. So you need to set a limit of when you're gonna accrue, adjust for, is everything over 100 pounds, 200 pounds, whatever it may be, be consistent. So if you do it year on year, use that same level to be consistent. You don't want to be accruing for every small five pound here, 10 pounds there, you want to set a level to be consistent. And also consider regularity. If you have things that happen on a month by month basis, for example, you may not need to accrue for them. If you have, let's say a grand maintenance contract coming in every month and you pay him a thousand pounds and he does some grass cutting, some hedge cutting, some tree work. That happens every month, but you pay him on the receipt of an invoice. So if you receive his March invoice, you're not going to pay it till April. Do you need to therefore adjust for that, put an accrual in? Not necessarily, because if you've paid him 12 months for in the financial year, then it doesn't matter necessarily what 12 months it is, just that you've got 12 within the financial year. The only point where you might think actually I need to put an accrual in is let's say in March a tree fell down and he did some additional work, you had another bill for thousand pounds, you'd accrue for that additional work but not the monthly regular payments that you're making. So be quite clear on what you need to adjust for, what you need to accrue for, what you need to prepay and at what level. Okay and also ensure that last year's adjustments are reversed particularly if you're not using software, you're using a spreadsheet for example, you need to make and make sure you do a manual reversal so that you're and report can calculate correctly. Okay, so that takes me through now to thinking about each individual box on the accounting statement section that I want to talk about individually. So box one is your balances brought forward and I put there ensure equal to box seven of the previous year. That sounds really obvious, but really good starting point just to make sure was your closing position last year, was it correct? Is it now your starting position for this financial year? Is it your box one figure? Okay, box two, it says precept or rates and levies. Precept, so it's just your precept account. So we'll ignore the rates and levies, that refers to the drainage boards. Don't get caught up by that. You don't need to put seal or anything else in there. Literally just your precept, okay? And also if you receive a lump sum from your, your council, the district council where they pay you the precept and then maybe an additional grant, make sure you're just putting the precept element in box two, okay? Box three, total other receipts. So that's everything else. So we literally, if you're on receipts and payments, you've got your cash book, you take your figure for your preset, all your other receipts are in box three. Okay. Be mindful though, not to include any bank transfers. If, particularly if you use a manual system and you show bank transfers coming in on one side and going out, if you're moving between your deposit account and your current account, for example. No bank transfers in here, because it's just movement of money within the council. And also be mindful of if you've got any refunds or overpayments being paid back to you, although you've received that money back, it should be an adjust reduction to your payments, not shown in receipts. Okay. And also exclude VAT if working in IME. Now that's true of all the boxes, so I'm not going to keep mentioning that, but just be mindful that that won't show up Okay, feel that listed. So box four, staff costs. So yeah, be aware of new guidance as to what can be included. As I mentioned before, that's now changed. So what can be in there now? is just more you know, the core staff cost and core salary cost of salary, and I tax pension. Other things like home working, mileage, traveling, subsistence are now not included. So not only do you need to make sure that this financial year you don't include them and you're just showing those core costs, but as I said, you need to reset last year. So anything that you had in staff costs for those elements that now are no longer staff costs, 
need to be in box six. Okay, so box five, loan interest or capital repayments, straightforward, if you've got a loan and you're repaying it, those, those repayments need to be shown as a separate figure in box five. Box six, all other payments, that's everything else basically, so that's totally all your payments, box four is the staff element, box five is the loan, all other payments in box six. Again, on the flip side of that, don't include any bank transfers. If you move money about, don't move to the side of that bank transfer the payment. Again, exclude VAT as well, if you're working income expenditure. So box seven, these are your balances carried forward. So you need to again make sure that it all adds up. So this is your starting position, box one, plus your income, precept and other receipts, boxes two and three, less all your payments out. So boxes four, five and six, staff costs, loan new payments, other payments to get to box seven. So do obviously make sure that that adds up. You can have a two pound tolerable difference due to your rounding because you will show them in whole numbers on the, on the accounting statements, but make sure they plot up. Okay, box eight is your total value of cash and your short term investment. This will be equal to your bank rec. So your starting position at the way you, before you get into this, you'll have done your bank reconciliation. That figure of your total bank position needs to be box eight. If you're in receipts and payments, boxes seven and eight will be the same figure. If they're not, then there's something wrong with some of the figures that you've put in. They must be the same, okay? If they're not the same, it's very likely that the way that you've dealt with unpresented checks is incorrect, okay? At year end, if you had any unpresented items, checks that you've sent out that as of yet haven't been cashed, you still need to include them. You still show them as a payment and you still you would adjust them in your bank reconciliation. So be quite clear on that. The boxes seven and eight need to be the same in receipts and payments. If you're an income expenditure, they'll be different. Okay, and it'll be necessary to explain that difference in a separate report, and they'll be different due to your debtors and your creditors, so your calls and your prepayments that you've put in. So all the people that either owe you money or you owe to them will adjust for that to give you that difference. Okay. Box is nine, box nine, sorry, fixed assets and long-term investments. So you just need to make sure that you've updated for any new assets or anything that you've disposed of within the financial year. Make sure you're consistent with your reporting. So do you use the original purchase value? Do you use the current value? If moving between them, make sure you're clear on that. You may need to restate so it's clear on which approach you're using. Make sure that you've got your supporting asset register to show all the relevant information. So the same way that your cash book will be your supporting information of the boxes we've just talked about, the asset register needs to support your figure that you're seeing in box nine. Okay, and there's something, as I said, the internal auditor will check as well. And make sure you ignore depreciation. So no accounting adjustments against your assets. They're literally the, what you bought it for, what you suppose, etc. in there. Okay. Box 10 is borrowing. So, so this is simply just the figure that you owe at year end. So if you've got a loan, like this from the Public Works Loan Board, update that figure to be what's owed at year end. Okay. So once you've gone through the process of doing all those boxes in, taking from the cash book adjustment to get those figures in, considering those things I've talked about, there are a few other documents that you need to have alongside it. So the bank reconciliation, so as at the 31st of March, as we talked about, must agree to box eight, okay? If you're working in income and expenditure, you must have your reconciliation between box seven and eight because they won't be the same, and that would be a summary of your debtors and creditors. So you'll get a format from the auditor that you'll fill in where you show the different elements that work out the difference between box seven and box eight. And you also need to complete an explanation of variances if you've got them that are over 15% for boxes two, three, four, five, six, nine, and 10. So that's based on the current financial year to the last financial year. If the amount between the same boxes has changed more than 15%, you need to explain why. And also if box seven is more than box two. So box seven is your total funds and box two is your preset. So that would be like you're saying that you're holding twice as much as your preset. That would mean you've got, got quite a lot in the bank and therefore it must be down to reserves that you have and therefore you need to give a breakdown of all your reserves. Make sure if you need to explain these variances, you give full numerical explanations, be very clear on what the breakdown is. You can't just say that receipts are down this year because of COVID, I didn't hire out the full and it's a lot less. You need to be quite specific about this was last year, this is my figure for this year, this has happened because of this, this and this break it down be clear on it if it isn't you may find the auditor coming back to you asking more questions that you then may find incur the fee if you haven't given the correct information initially okay so 
so quite a big section there to take you through completing the agar thinking about filling all that in once you're at the point where you've done it what do you then do with regard to signing it publishing it where does it go what do you do with it okay so we'll look at that now so at the point that you've completed the accounting statements the rfa would now sign them off this is to say that they have been produced in accordance with guidelines proper practices to the best of their knowledge signing them off you'll then have your meeting of your council where you will receive and note from internal audit report approve your annual government statement approve the accounting statements as well okay if you are going to be able to exempt yourself so you're under the £25,000 and you meet the other criteria you this is where you'd also approve your certificate of exemption so this means that you've just been in something to say that you're exempt from the audit your certificate say you're exempt from the audit and then you don't need to provide any other information to the auditor okay the chairman and the RFA will then sign the annual governance statement and the chairman will sign the accounting statements as well. The RFA will already signed it and they'll sign them off as well. OK, this will then allow the RFA to set, up, set the commencement date for the exercise of public rights. OK, because you need to have all these as a company collated and ready to go. OK, so your accounting records must be made available to you by an interested person. So that's anyone who's interested why they might be who knows but anyone who wants to view them can do and can request to do so okay electors can also raise questions and make objections so people specifically involved in your parish elected in your parish can also raise questions against them as well and that means so the agar must be approved and published before this inspection period starts which is why it must at this point you need to approve it ready at the meeting to publish it to provide it them to review okay and the period of inspection is 30 days so we'll talk about dates in a moment. I specifically have left some dates off at the moment because of the uncertainty with regards to how it changed last year. And I'll mention that in a moment in a bit more detail. Okay. So once that's been done, it's now about the information that you provide to your auditor. Okay. So if you're exempting yourself from audit, all you need to do now is sign the certificate of exemption, the RFA and the chairman, and then that is sent to the external auditor. That's all they need. Provide, although you've done everything else, you don't send it to them, okay? Just send them the certificate of exemption. If you're not exempt from the audit, the audit, then you need to send the following documents to your external auditor. So the AGAR, basically those three elements, the internal audit report, the governance statement, the accounting statements, okay? Explanation of variances, bank reconciliation is at the 31st of March, the details of the exercise of public rights, so the, the range that you've given the details of that, and any other information specifically requested. So this might be the reconciliation between box seven and eight, the income expenditure, or any other information that you need to provide from when you filled it all in, particularly maybe if you've restated and you need to give more details as to why that was. Okay. So publication of documents. So this now will allow you to publish your documents. So if you're exempt from audit, you can publish everything pretty much. So you can publish all the elements of the AGAR, the variance analysis, the bank reconciliation, a copy of your certificate of exemption, the arrangements you've made for the exercise of public rights, and the name and address of the auditor. Okay, so at that point, if you're exempt from audit, if you're publishing, then you're, you're good to go. Okay. If you're not exempt from audit and therefore you sent your data off and you're waiting for them to come back, at this point, you would publish the relevance of the AGAR. You don't have to um, publish the internal audit report, but it's recommended to do so. But you also need to put alongside that a declaration that the accounts are as yet audited. So obviously, if you sent them off, you've not had it back yet. You need to just be clear about that. The details you've made for the arrangement of the exercise of public rights, the other one, and the name and address of your auditor. OK, and then once you do have it back from the auditor, so you've had it all back, it's been signed off. You can then update it with the notice of the conclusion of the audit, the annual governance statement and the accounting statements. And we have any amendments along with the external order to report the certificate because you get the signed off by the auditor's name, which is et cetera, and you have it from the auditor, you can then update it. Okay, so quite a lot to do there because you need to be quite clear on what needs to happen in what order. Okay, as I mentioned, dates, I've sort of purposely left off dates from the process because I think the most important thing at this point is understanding the process and what you need to do and the slight differences as to whether you're exempt or not exempt. Now I've put in here the normal year and then unlikely last year things changed quite dramatically um, with COVID coming along and stopping people being enforcing working from home, which made things difficult for completing these processes and meetings, etc. 
So generally about two months was added on to each of the deadlines. At the moment, we haven't seen any um, specific dates confirmations for this financial year. So if anybody knows any difference, it'd be great to know if you put it in the chat so that we can confirm for other people. As I understand it, there's a meeting um, JPEG in the sort of next couple of weeks or so where they'll decide. So in normal year, you'd be approved, you'll be doing your accounts and getting them sorted between 1st of April up to the 30th of June. And then you'd need to be publishing the, the 1st of July. Last year, that was the 1st of September because of this additional two months that was given due to the issues of last year. The public rights period was slightly different initially to include the first 10 working days of July, but last year it had to start on or before the 1st of September. And then the final audit normally it comes back and is then published, conclusion of audit before the 1st of October, but that was pushed back to the 1st of December. Okay. So normal year, hopefully, if we go back to that, then obviously that's what you need to follow. Whether they decide to do something a little bit differently um, yet to be seen. But I think the important thing, as I said here, is understanding the process of what you need to do in what order, and then you can fit in with the dates once they're confirmed. Okay. So the final thing um, I want to talk about today, and just to finish off, because I think where there's quite a lot of information that we sort of talked about there, things to think about, is actually looking ahead to the new financial year as well. I think the, the sort of focus, 1st of April comes along and the focus is right, I need to do my year end, I need to deal with 2020, 2021, I need to get those year end figures done, I need to complete my AGAR. Actually, the new financial year is now starting as well on the 1st of April as well, and that's something to think about as well. Now, you, if you're in a small account, so you may find it works for you to deal with your year end and then look ahead to the new financial year. But for a lot of you, I would imagine you still need to continue from the 1st of April moving through working you know, in the new financial year as well. So this is a good time now to set up your cash book for the new financial year so you can get that done so you're ready to go. So it's not something you need to think about in the midst of the year end. It's just ready to start using alongside from the 1st of April. Okay. And it may also be a good time to objectively review your accounts records, your cash book, and think about how improvements could be made because it makes sense, it's a good time to start with a blank canvas from a new financial year rather than trying to make changes throughout the year. It's easy to do that now, set it up now. And think about what about your current cash book don't you like? What doesn't it do? What makes it hard? What is tricky for you? What could you improve upon? So I've put there, consider changing of medium or your coding structure. So it just may be the way that it's set up, the codes that you've got, the format that you work in, okay? So then back, basing it on your budget or preset breakdown, that sounds really obvious, but it's surprising how many people I've spoken to where they have a nice budget list of budget codes and they have an individual budget against each of these codes. And then they have a cash book where the codes bear no resemblance to the budget and it's all in there. And it's very, very difficult then to analyze the spend against those budget codes because there's no resemblance between the cash book and the budget sheet. So it's obviously a good place to start to think about that. Are additional codes needed to analyze the data further or is it too detailed? Do you currently put a lot of information under one code that actually be really helpful to break down? Do you have one parks and open spaces and everything goes in there, but actually I'd really like to see how much I spend on the play park, how much I spent on grass cutting, what happens at the nature reserve, whatever it may be, would that be useful? Or do you have, hundreds of codes all along and you're putting one item maybe against each code in the financial year and it's just not worth it do you need to consolidate them another thing to consider do you need to record more information to make it easy to refer to when you're looking stuff up do you find that you look it up on your cash book but then you have to trawl through your paper records to find more information from the original document the original invoice would it be useful to show the invoice number more description of what it's to do with would that help you going forward so you think about things that you don't like about your cash book that make it hard for you, what you struggle with, what reports take you a long time to produce, and maybe give some consideration to the new financial year because now is a really good time to make some changes to help you so that in a year's time when you're thinking about year end for next year, you're in a much better position and hopefully things will be a bit easier for you. Okay, so that takes me through everything that I wanted to talk about today. So I'm just going to stop my share for now and hand back to Tim. Brilliant. Thank you, Hannah. That was fantastic. So much um, information in your presentation. Lots, lots, lots in there, I think. A lot of, I feel like I've, yeah, a lot of information to take in for everybody there. 
you know, there's a lot, there's a lot of things to get right. And I think there's also lots of different situations to take into account. So we've got absolutely loads of questions and we'll get around to as many as, as we can. Um, just to clarify that we will be sending out afterwards a recording of the whole event. And so you can go back and, and pause the video and see, um, to clarify different points that have been made. Um, Hannah will also send out um, slides so you can have the slides on, on hand as well. Um, Hopefully you guys found that helpful. Um, if any feedback that you've got from the presentation, please do you know, put it into the uh, the chat. Um, otherwise, let's move on to the Q&A. Some people have asked the Q&A in the chat, like I su suggested, but actually there's also another Q&A tab um, at the bottom. And it's a little bit easier for us to bring people in for the Q&A uh, with that tab. So if you have any questions, look at the Q&A, type it in there, um, and we'll get to your questions. So um, regarding the Q&A, there's obviously there's 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 a lot of things which are kind of set in stone, and there's a few things around the areas that are more gray, gray areas, and we do our best to, to answer the things to the best of our ability. But there may things be things that come up that we're not 100 percent sure about. And if you're sitting there watching and you know the answer better than we, then it's a community, and please do type the answer that you think is right in the chat. And uh, we don't want to share the ideas and, and and make sure we can benefit from everyone working together. So. Excellent. So Hannah, um, who are we going to bring in first for the first question? Perfect. Okay. So first question, we are going to bring in Selena Clark. So let's bring her in. Hopefully, Selena, can you hear us? Are you there? Bear with me. Oh, there we go. There we go, Selena, you should be able to talk now. Thank you, that's better. <laughs> um, so, yes, mine's a really, really simple, uh, simple question. And I'm, I'm sure when I backtrack and look what other people have done before me, I'll know the answer. But mine was really, um, I've never done a VAT return before, um, so I'm dreading doing that. But then I'm thinking about the way our cash book has been set up. Um, which is not brilliant, by the way. Uh, um, they put uh, previous people put in the whole cost of the invoice, but then just the well, if they've even put it in the VAT amount. But then when I'm thinking about what we've got to return um, at the end of the year, when I put my invoice totals, do I put the whole of the invoice um, or just the the amount of the invoice less the VAT amount. Okay, so in the catalog, I'd always suggest that you have a net column, a VAT column, and then a total, so you can clearly see which of your invoices have got VAT on it. You're then, uh, yeah. yeah, so you've got that, so you've got your VAT column for the return. When it's what you're putting in the accounting statements will depend on whether your receipts and payments or income and expenditure. If it's receipts and payments, you literally just take it out of the cash book as the total figure. So it's everything, including VAT as well. Brilliant. Because, yeah, I've got it set up with the, like a, a gross net and a VAT, but yeah. I think just not knowing what to do at the year end. I was... Yeah, so if you're in receipts, receipts and payments, you take... I am receipts and payments. Yeah, yeah, total figures then, including VAT, yeah. Thank you. Okay, no problem. Thanks, Selena. Okay. Um, so next up, we have... Barbara, so I'll just bring Barbara in now. There we go, Barbara, you should be able to talk now. We should be able to hear you. Hi. Hi Hello. Yes, Hi, um, I work for two parish councils. One's definitely the uh, lower end of the scale financial wise. But I think I just want to be clear on the three years of 2000K what yeah. is that what is the 2000 the 200 yeah the 200,000 oh, sorry 200 yeah, that, no that's fine so it's income or expenditure so whether you're I you can be over one not the other maybe but it's once you're over on either of them and it's three consecutive years so it's total income that you've received so whether it's preset and anything else that you're getting in so that's total figures or payments that you've made out so total gross figures as well so I if either of those are over 200,000 three consecutive years then you should be in working in income expenditure oh that's very helpful thank you perfect thank you Thanks, Barbara. Barbara um okay so 
Next question is from Catherine. There you go, Catherine. We can hear you now. Hello. Um, I think I think the, the question was answered already. It was I ah. put the question in before before you got to that point. So I think oh, okay. I understand now. All right, no problem, Catherine. Is there anything else you wanted to ask? No, thank you. Okay, thank you. Bye bye. Bye. If you yeah, if you're not so on the home, I just mentioned if you go to the JPAG practitioner's guide, look up box four. It gives you a breakdown of exactly what is box four staff costs and what now isn't, and then you can make sure you're completely clear so the things that you include are correct. Perfect. Okay. So um, can I jump in quickly? Yeah. I'm not sure if everyone's aware that there's actually um, a tax break for working at home, um, which you can claim for. I'm just going to put the link to the government the guidance on the government website. So if you haven't, if you're working at home and you haven't claimed uh, the tax allowance, then you should should do. It's worth about I can't remember how much it's worth. Do you remember Hannah? How much it's worth per? Is it about six pounds a week, something like that. I think the threshold, I don't think, increases your tax allowance by that, something like that. It's not loads, but it every little helps. Every little helps. So hopefully. <laughs> You're not claiming it six pounds a week, enough for a couple of cups or something. <laughs> um, Irene. Okay, so I think have we kind of covered this question, Hannah? Yeah, I think it's the same as um, yeah. Yeah, perfect. So we'll skip past you, Irene, but let us know if you want to have anything else. Um, Sue does. Let's bring Sue in. There we go, Sue. We can hear you now. Oh, if you're still there. Hello. Hi, Sue. Um, yeah, I think um, I've sort of worked this out for myself, but I'm assuming that on um, box three, that where we've had a £75,000 public works loan, that that would also go in there as a receipt. It would, yes. Yeah. So you'd show it as a receipt because you've received it, and then you'd have the corresponding value in box 10. So you'd explain your receipts would be higher probably in this year because you've had that loan as a receipt. Yeah. But therefore, it's also higher in box 10 because you've received that as foreign. Yeah, you're correct. Okay, and where you where you um, work out the balance of the borrowings, do you um, presumably you get a year end statement from PWLB? Do you? You should do yes, so you can yeah. clearly see what you've had, what you've therefore paid back, and then make sure that your loan, less your box five repayments, is then what you've got left to go. Yeah, and would you add that in with your Agar paperwork to, to send that as a explanation of variances? If if it's clear, so if you're, because the variance is the receipt, obviously a lot higher because you've had that loan. If you just can say to them, the loan we've had is 75,000, whatever it is, that should be absolutely fine. If they did ask for more, you may need to provide it. But if you've broken it down without needing, to, you know, and everything's accounted for, they shouldn't necessarily need to see any paperwork behind that. Lovely. Thanks, Hannah. I thought the slides were really good. Oh, thank you. I appreciate that. Thank you. Thanks, Sue. Okay, next up we have Debbie. Uh, I think that goes back to. Um, yes, you've covered this one. Yep, yeah, 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 pass yeah. that one. Have a look at yeah, JPEG and then that will give you that practitioner's guide and that'll show you that one. Perfect. Um, okay. Um, here we go. The next question. And if we have to answer this, just stop me, Hannah, and I'll. Skip no, yeah, no, no, you're fine. No, no. <laughs> okay, so I can bring in films. Hi, it's Fiona, actually. Oh, is it Fiona? Yeah. <laughs> I, I, I must have mistyped it when I, when I put the thing in. Well, I wasn't sure if it was like an, uh, an Irish spelling no. or... or... <laughs> no, no, definitely Fiona. Fiona. Um, I think you may have answered this when you were going through, but I lost my volume. So we had to make an insurance claim this year, um, and obviously that was paid out. Would you include that as income or negative payment on your cash flow? I would say that's income because it wasn't the specific thing that you had paid back to you from your, obviously you're paying your insurance out, but you've had a specific income relating to that claim. So I would say that as an, as an income for the claim itself. Okay, even though the money obviously went straight out to pay the bill. So did you pay... We pay. We had to. We've, we're claiming the VAT back because the insurers won't pay us for that. And obviously, we've had to pay an excess, so it is less than we've paid out. So it isn't an exact match. I would. I would show that then as in the money coming in and then the corresponding money going out on that because it's not like you've overpaid and it's been refunded. I would say you've okay. received that in order to to deal with whatever it the damage. Okay. Is. 
But if you had, sorry, can I tack on to this? If you had yeah. a refund back, so like we closed one of our phone lines with BT and had a refund back on a bill that had already been paid, that would go as a negative payment Correct. rather than income. Yes. Because although yeah. you had it as income, it's, all it is is a correction of something that in theory is overpaid. Yeah. So yes, it's a reduction of payment. Yeah, okay, thank yeah. you. Perfect. Perfect. Thank you, Fiona. Um, and the next question, the public mm -hmm. one. Bring in Owen. I'm unmuted now, is that all right? Yeah, can we can hear you. Hear you. Um, yeah, I, I've obviously not been a Scribe user until now. Um, so I'm setting up my 2122, trying to. Um, uh, so I can be ready for April the 1st. So currently yeah. I'm working on spreadsheets. Um, when I've gone into the, or logged in, I've noticed that it's not easy to change the year. It's still showing as 21, uh, 2021. I can't get it to show 21, 22. Okay, so, so this is your first, you're logging on to Scribe for the first time and it's defaulting yeah. to 20, yeah, that's fine. What, if, yeah, if you want to just either let me know that the council will drop us a message on what council it is, I can just update that behind the scenes for you and then your Brilliant. starting year will be 21, 22. Smashing. Lovely, thank you. Yeah, yeah just let us know what council and we'll... I will, thank you. Super, thank Perfect. you. Thanks, so, Um, If I can just jump in quickly. Um, we also have a series for our Scribe customers, a series of um, training sessions like this, small group training sessions where... You can jump in. So, if anyone, if anyone does have any very scribe specific questions, um, you can. If you go onto our website, if you go to the top and you go on to learn and the drop down, there's the Scribe Academy, and in there it shows all our training sessions. So, uh, you can book in for as many training sessions as you want. It's all included in, in the fees. So, please don't feel like you're stuck. Book in, and uh, we can help you out. Perfect. Okay, we've got time for a few more questions. Yeah, we've got time. Yeah, perfect. Okay. So we're going to bring in Kay. Okay, Kay, you're here now, so you should be able to talk. Hi. Hello. The okay. question is just about reversing out the um, prepayments and accruals, really. Um, does that have to be done by journal, or can it done, be done by manually on the spreadsheet where we calculate these? Yeah, so if, you, if you're working with a spreadsheet, then you can just put, put them in, basically. If you've got if you know what happened at the end of last year with regards to your prepayments and accruals at yeah. the beginning of the year, they would reverse. You then have your actual accounts for this time, front and financial year, and then you'd add on adjustments at this year. So they, okay. it's as simple as that. You don't have, yeah, you can just you don't have to give specific details of that. Right. So are. on that spreadsheet, then I could just use last year's details yes, and then yes, put the new yes, year and then yes. take the balance. That's it. Yeah, last yeah. year, whatever you happened last year. Yeah. Reverse out. So we've got that detail, you're just reversing them this year and then adding in the new ones at the end. Okay, thank you. Yep. Thanks. Thanks, Kay. Um, and next up we have Helen. Ah, a couple of questions from Helen. So let's bring Helen in. Hi. Hi, Helen. Hi. Yeah, it's just this this that. Um, I think I did contact Scribe once about it. I've managed to persuade, yeah. Yeah, I've managed to persuade my council into setting a net budget because it was a gross budget and then it was very confusing with my net figures from Scribe. So have I done wrong? Is that is that wrong? No. So for receipts and payments at year end in the accounting statements, you're going to show that because you're in receipts and payments, it's your total cash book figures like that. On a day-to-day -day basis with budgets though, I'd always say that you want a net budget and Good. you're not interested in the VAT, you're going to claim the VAT back. So it's perfectly correct to have a net budget. So your summary report should be in net and they're the figures that you've got in there. And at year end though, when you report them, the VAT will be included. But on yeah. a sort of month you. by month basis, working out budget versus actuals, use net figures. Great, that's excellent, thank you. Perfect. Thanks, Helen. Okay, next up. Bring in Joanne. Hi, yeah. Hello. Um, well, it relates to this thing about staff costs. They seem to move staff costs and change staff costs every single year. Yeah, mileage was including in staff costs. It was. Um, now it's not. Yeah. Um, uh, they haven't. The JPEG for, guide for this 2021 hasn't actually been published yet. So when will that be published? Will there be oh. changes to that again? It, so it was published within 2020. It was optional as to whether this was updated for last year's accounts, we didn't have to, but it means so for this year from now, it needs to be. 
right. So they're not going to public republish again for. I well, they will. I think they probably will republish it, but it won't affect what you need to do for this current financial year because it will be it, those already set in stone for staff costs for this year. So yeah, not so, so don't include mileage. Right. It's just that mileage. Um, the mileage is actually driving me up the wall. Um, so mileage is definitely not in staff costs now. No, box six, not box. Six. Right. Okay. So working from home allowance. Um, staff are getting paid for working from home is that in staff costs or not no staff cost now is just like the core staff cost so salary ni tax pension but what you can do is no reason why you're within your cash book if you want to manage it as staff cost to see the total of that you can have that it's just when you come to do the accounting statements in the agar you need to split it out so if it works for you to see account for total of staff cost including those items that's fine it's just when you get to the year end and do it on the agar they need those elements need to be in box six not box four yeah because last year my staff costs were um mileage wasn't in staff costs but i told it had to be in staff costs so i've moved it it's not going to be comparable last year because last year's mileage was just as classed as a payment that's yes yeah, so that's right yeah. so yeah. i really need to be so redo this year's to make class mileage as a payment and then we'll be fine yeah you got it, it yeah it's just that they keep changing the mind and the auditor says they're going to tweak it again before April. I mean, I'm not being funny, but March is next week. I mean... I know, it's just it's just unnecessary. I've not seen anything. I hope so. I hope they don't because that's obviously what they've then changed and then is now for this year that they're talking about restating last year as well. Um, and I would, if they do change it, I wouldn't expect it to be relevant until 2021-22 now. So I would go with what this is because I can't think that they're going to change it at this point. Yeah. When did they actually decide? Because, well, I would imagine it will come out with when they have this meeting that they're going to have with um, to decide about these dates as well. So hopefully there'll be some clarification on that as well. But certainly the one for March 2020 is talking about what you need to do for this financial year. So staff costs don't now they currently include my, yeah, mileage for those other items. But I agree right. that they shouldn't keep changing their mind. It does. Not you know what, it's either in staff costs or it's not in staff costs. I know, costs. it's just that one year, one year to another. The yeah. But they yeah. change the amount you every year, and then every year you have to restate I last know. year's because, and it's just like, it's either one thing or it's not, and I'm not bothered which one it is. Just you want to know, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Perfect, okay. So we've got time for a few more. Stop sharing my screen. Um, we've got some here that are in the chat that I haven't been able to Let's have a look. Um, okay, Michael Roberts, I think I missed Michael before, so let's bring Michael in. Bear with me. Okay. Michael, you should be able to speak now. I'm going to put your question up on the screen. Oh, Michael, are you there? Sorry. Can you hear That's me? It. Yeah, yep. we can hear you. Yeah, hello. Technology overwhelmed me. <laughs> pay an insurance premium um, on a quite a big sports pavilion that we built and paid for. Um, and the sports club, which is separate from the parish council, um, then pays us roughly half that premium, which relates to the uh, building cover on the sports club. We've always treated that as a receipt and the premium as a payment. But picking up your point about refunds being offset, should we actually be treating it as that refund, that, that payment of the premium by the sports club as a negative payment? I would say that you should still show it as income because it's more like a contribution. So although you're, you're dealing with the insurance premium, it's not a direct relationship to them paying it back. It's their, they, pay, they, pay, they definitely pay it so, to us. Yes, yeah, yeah. yeah, so it's obviously it relates to that, but it's not kind of, I would, I would say it's still income because you're paying the insurance and then they're paying you for that. So I'd say that's fine. I can come off the naughty step. <laughs> yes, <laughs> I will allow that. <laughs> Thank you. Thanks, Michael. Um, so I'm going to bring in Debbie, who's got a question about grants. There we go. Debbie, we can, you should be able to speak now. Yeah, okay. Um, 
Yeah, I, I haven't phrased this very well, but I just wanted to double check that the grants go in box three and the income in box six. Sorry, the, and the spend in box six. Yes, I know what you mean. Yes, yes. So you've had your grant coming in, that's other receipt, and then you pay it out, whatever you're doing with it. Yeah, so other payment six. Yeah. yeah. Okay, thank you. Perfect. Thank you, Debbie. Um, I'm going to bring in what else we've we got here. Trying to get through as many as possible. Um, let's bring in Carol now with a question about internet. I know this is something internet banking comes up a lot on our Clarks group. A lot of questions about that. So, Carol, I've brought you in now. You should be able to speak and answer your question. Ask you your question. Good morning. Before morning. I say anything else, thank you very much indeed for a most interesting morning. But my question is, I'm only a small council and they have taken to internet banking this year. I just want to make sure the measures I put in place are uh, adequate for auditing purposes. Is there anything special that I need to be aware of? Okay, so what, how would you approve your process? And that's probably the main thing about how they're approved for. A lot of people will log on and set the payments up and then have two people that want councillors to log on and then approve them before they're paid, something like that. Have you got... Um, I'm still keeping it a bit manual because okay. my council is um, quite happy to do this method that they've used before, which is I create a, um, um, the invoice comes in, I create a payment authority, I get that signed by two councillors, and then I go and pay the bill in, re in, in retrospect. And then I take a copy from the internet of the tick that shows that I've actually paid the bill. Um, yeah. And I think I've try to keep the trail very much in the old format that they understand I don't want to change them too much no that sounds good I think the important thing there is obviously that approval before you do it so that's the important thing the other potential thing is that sort of trail as well because obviously with checks you had a check number and it's very obvious if you had a gap yeah. in the ticket so it may be worth working about how you've got a sequence or I if, have yeah that's fine so you've got that thing so you can clearly show that there's no gap or no other unauthorized payments have been made because you've got that sort of numbering system somehow in there. Um, other people may have sort of systems that they're using if they want to pop anything in in the chat or anything. But yeah, that sounds like what you've got is sort of following on from the process you're using with checks and applying yeah. that in the same way. So that sounds. Yeah. Thank you very very much indeed. Yeah. Okay. Thanks, Carol. Um, Thank you. Let's have the next question from Trisha, bring Trisha in. Um, regarding reserves, Hannah, I know you, you do like reserves and all that kind of stuff. <laughs> Morning, can you hear me? Hello. We can hear you. Lovely. Um, you mentioned that your reserves shouldn't be twice as much as your preset. In the past, what we've done is write a letter to the auditor explaining what the reserves are for is that enough or should we have a policy so if you i would if you, presumably you've got something that breaks down that you're holding this much in each of these pots of money or reserves for each item have you something like that yes yeah so that's that's basically like having a policy really being clear so as long as you're very clear that you're if you're holding additional funds in the bank then you're very clear what that's for then that's you know that's all you need to have and be able to be not only give a list of what those reserves are, but be quite clear about how that's been worked out based on obviously what you're going to be planning to do, how much you think each of those elements is going to cost and can be done, etc. That's all the important things that you need to hold um, to be able to give that information. But you've got that. brilliant. Okay, lovely. Thank you so much. It's been a really useful morning. Oh, thank you. Thank you, Tricia. Um, okay, what else have we got here? Um, we still good for time, Tim? Still. Oh, you on mute. Schoolboy error, the, the mute problem. <laughs> Come we have on. A questions left. Um, we'll, we'll get through as many as we can, but I think we've got another, we can do another 10 minutes of questions, I think, if everyone's happy. Yeah. Perfect. Okay. Let's see what we've got. I'm just going trawling through the list here, make sure I'm not missing any. Um, just whilst you're um, bringing the next question in, Hannah, I just, just, um, want to quickly introduce everybody to Mel. Mel has just joined us. Um, Mel, do you want to quickly say hello? And yeah, Mel's in charge of sales at Scribe. Um, you want to say hello and give a bit of introduction to yourself, please, Mel? Yes, Hannah. of course. Hello, everybody. Uh, my name is Mel Moritz. And yes, as Tim said, um, I uh, run the sales team. Um, but really, our focus is about helping customers, and in particular, councils who um, 
don't necessarily have access to scribers yet or hasn't signed up. Um, we like to impart some information to them in terms of um, looking at how their council council being um, managed at the minute and how Scribe could help plug some ga gaps. We're finding specifically um, when it comes to GDPR compliance that that's something we can help with. We've had some legal advice. We've looked at software providers. So we can definitely, there's, there's, there's a great, great load of information that we can share with you. So it's really handy to get in touch um, if you wanted to talk about that. Um, the other thing that I think is worth discussing, anybody that's on Excel spreadsheets, just consider whether you've got your audit trails in place. Because um, again, that is very tricky to manage through Excel. And again, our focus is really to be here and help and support and give you information so that you can make your decision. So thanks, Tim. Thank you. So hopefully Hannah's got our next question lined yep. up. So we'll run through some more of these questions, then we'll quickly have a look at Scribe, doing a year-end in Scribe with um, other Hannah, and then the competition at the end for the gin. So back on to the Q&A. Perfect. I'm going to bring in Don now with this question. Hopefully Don's there. In, indeed, and uh, happily Hello. technology seems to work, if you can hear me. Yeah, um, we can hear you. Yes, it's working. So, Don't worry. <laughs> uh, Hannah, I think I, I may have been slightly distracted when you were talking about the change in staff costs, although I uh, understand that uh, uh, they are now expressed just as national you know, salary, national insurance, all the fixed costs and things like mileage uh, are now excluded. But I think you may have said that you need to now need to restate the previous year. Mm -hmm. So... Um, so we've basically actually got to go back and restate our accounts because of this change. Yeah, so all that really involves though is just identify within box four of last year, what element was mileage, homeworking, training, et cetera. And literally that figure comes out of box four, goes into box six, and that's all you need to do. Okay, but yeah, thanks very much. Thanks, Don. Okay, I'm gonna bring in Stephen, the question about VAT. Stephen, are you in? No, not yet. Oh, I don't know if Stephen's still here. I think Stephen might have gone, so we'll go to the next one. Um, bring in Dan now with a question about auditors. Dan, I think you're on mute still. Hi there, can you hear me? We can, <laughs> yeah. Great. Is this a general question, really? I know the external auditors were, is it Little John last year? Yeah, yeah. The same this year, to be honest with you. Yeah, they are. They have a, they a five year contract from the 2017 18 year, I think it is. So they'll have, sorry, 18, 19, 19 20, 21. Yeah, so they'll get yeah, the still, and then I think they'll have next year as well, and then they'll go out again. But yeah, they are the same this year. Cool. And I don't know if this is a silly question. I don't know. But the actual AGAR paperwork, do we get, do, I can't remember, do, does that actually come from them or do we just download it from somewhere? You should get some correspondence from them to provide it all. It is all on their website if you want to go and have a look and get it from them initially, but you should get correspondence from them with all your information you need. Lovely. And I do have one more. Is that all right? Yeah, sure. One. And again, it's just to do with uh, with paperwork. Um, you mentioned, uh, is it the JPEG Practitioner's Guide? Yeah, that's it. Is that free? Is that a free it is. guide? Yeah. It is. Yeah. Yeah. And can, can we get that from your website at all? Or is, is that, is that? Um, let me, if I go, and, no, I don't know if I can get it. Find I can it find the link. We can just drop the link in, in a moment. Or yeah, if you go on the auditor's website, there's a link on there, but we'll, we can put a link in in a moment, I think, can we? Yeah. Yeah, brilliant. Oh, that's great. Thanks ever so much. No problem. Thanks, Dan. Thank you. Okay, so next up, um, I'm gonna bring in Simon. Now, just to, Simon just wants something clarifying. Hi, Simon. Hello, can you hear me? Yes, we can. Hello. Oh, sorry, I can't, I can't hear you now. <laughs> oh, you can't hear us? Oh, there we are. Yeah, that's fine. Um, sorry, getting bogged down with um, the new staff costs thing. I, I then saw in your slides about uh, the uh, need for the RFO to sign the AGS with the chairman. Um, <clears throat> one of my parish clerk roles, um, sorry, one of my employment roles is RFO only and not parish clerk. And I'd understood that it was the parish clerk's uh, role to sign the annual governance statement with the chairman. And uh, on the other side of the coin, 
the RFO and the chairman to sign the annual accounting statements. So that's just, <clears throat> I didn't want to get bogged down in something else new. Uh, so I just thought I'd, I'd seek that clarification. Um, is that something that um, you're aware of or, or not? Well, the, the information I took that from does clearly state it's the RFO. Obviously, a lot of the time the clerk is the RFO, so that may be interchangeable. But if it's if you've got a clerk and an RFO, according to the information I found, it should be the RFO signing it. Uh, again, to clarify, the annual governance statement, not the accounting statements. Okay, I'll have to yeah. look into that and yeah. check. But from what I saw, it did it did certainly say the RFO. Right. Again. Okay, uh, that, that's, that, 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 that was my point. Um, and and uh, if it's all right, uh, when we talk about uh, restating, oh, yeah. um, I'm trying to think. No, it was simply a matter of um, including, not, not including the staff mileage this year. Um, and I don't know about everyone else, but um, it's possible that we won't have any staff mileage this year anyway, <laughs> uh, since okay. our last meetings were in March. So uh, the <laughs> physical ones anyway, but um, uh, I hope that gives relief to somebody. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, good point. <laughs> Thank you. Thanks, Simon. Simon. Okay, who else we got? Uh, Um, just making sure these questions, some of them are very similar to ones we've already had. Um, we're kind of, we're running a little bit short on time. So are we? Yeah. You know, we, um, if any, if there's a question, anyone has a question that hasn't been answered, it's desperate to ask. If you can just, just type you, your name in there or put your, um, put your hand up or type in the chat console and we'll go back in the Q&A and find you. There's, there's quite a few in there still, so we've kind of got a bit lost with the, with the, the amount. Yeah. Um, so just, yeah, if anyone has been something desperate to say. Jane's raised her hand. So let's bring Jane in. Um, let's make this, let's make this the last one then. Okay. So for the ones we didn't manage to get around to, um, if you're a Scribe customer, please get in touch with us. We can, we can do our best to answer you. Um, otherwise we will be doing more training and um, uh, we will try and answer more questions in the next training session. So. Um, uh, also, if you're on the Facebook group or if you join the Facebook group, um, you can always ask on there if, other clerks can't answer. Um, Hannah's on there, so she can jump on and answer any questions you have as well. Um, so we're here to help. So any questions you have, yeah, just let us know. I've just, just brought in well. Jane. Um, I don't know what Jane's hi. question is. Hi, Jane. Hi, hi. It was it was about um, the variance this year. Our, our, the variance between our, what we budgeted for, obviously, and um, our income and expenditure is going to be um, vastly different because of COVID. We, we were in a community centre and it's been short. Um, but you said, Hannah, you said not to use COVID as, as a reason for that. What? what oh, so, yeah, so do I need to be more specific? It's... Yeah, so you can, I just meant about working in terms of just as sort of textual and not, not giving numbers. Obviously, that's a perfectly adequate reason, but you wouldn't, if you had a variance, don't just put COVID meant I had no hall hire. You'd need to use the numbers to back it up to say, last year we had five grand, this year we had 500 quid. That's the, but the reason is COVID. So as long as you've got numbers, the reasoning is fine. It's just okay. Yeah, just, Thank just, you. just the example that you shouldn't just write an explanation without giving numerical backing up of that. So okay. Thank you. Yeah. Perfect. Thanks, Jane. Great. Thank you, Jane. So um, next up, I'd like just like to get Hannah to show you how to do the year end with inscribe accounts. Yeah. And whilst she's bringing that up, I just want to explain to you a little bit about um, about GDPR and the way that kind of impacts things. Um, GDPR, unfortunately, is at the moment the, the um, ICO is kind of targeting larger organizations in terms of getting GDPR right, um, but slowly, slowly changing. Uh, and one, one thing, the one big thing about GDPR is personal information. And the two kind of key points to bear in mind when you're doing GDP, when you're keeping your own records is um, having a policy that you only keep personal information for a certain period of time and that you have a way of knowing when that personal information was entered and that you've got a way of then deleting that personal information. So it's kind of tricky. Um, and that's one thing that Scribe can help you with. But anyways, on to year end with Scribe. Over to you, Hannah. Okay, lovely. So this is Scribe. I'm in my fictitious account for Scribe Parish Council that I use for the training that we do here. Okay, the first thing that you can see under the setup menu, you've got the council profile. And this allows you to set the relevant elements about your council so that you see the specific menu options when it comes to things like year end to get the right 
tailor made menu of options for you. Okay. So if I set under account and pipe receipts and payments, I'll get the relevant year and menu options for working receipts and payments. And I can also do show income and expenditure. So by setting that, you'll get it in the right format for you. So we'll look at it in terms of receipts and payments. Okay. So that has now updated my menu option on the left hand side. So I have a year end menu for receipts and payments in here. Okay. So generally, you'd work through the year, you'd put all your transactions on, you'd reconcile the bank, you'd have all that information held within Swipe. Okay. At that point, you then be able to go into the year end menu and complete these elements in order that it can run the accounting statements for you. Okay. So it will pull all the information together on this receipts and payments account, which is the summary of everything that you've put into Scribe. So you can see these are all the codes that I've set up in Scribe. You may have many, many more. If you're a large account, you may have fewer. Okay. But that's completely tailored as to what you want to set in there and what is meaningful to you and your council. Okay. Scribe will then pull everything that you've put in into each of these um, codes against each of these codes as you can see for your receipts and payments and this is basically the backbone of the annual return so everything that you've put in here will pull through for you so it'll do everything for you once you've reconciled your bank and you know it balances you're ready to go okay you can also have an asset register in Swive. you can see i've got, got many things in here but you can list every asset that you've got in here with all the information what it cost you what it's worth now you can add photos against it as well and then the total of your assets will then feature feed through to box nine on the annual return as well so this is all about the background pulling everything together okay if you have loans there's also a page for borrowing so you come and put that information in here update your outstanding amount and again that will feed through for you okay so once you get to the point of being right ready to run the annual return on scribe rather than having to manually collate all the data you can pull it through okay you just run it you can run it as many times as you like on swipe so if you run it and realize you need to change something you can pull it through you see you're getting figures appearing in boxes here behind the scenes against all the codes in swipe you set where they link to so when you have your code for the precepts you set it so that it links to box two so automatically it will appear in here Okay, if you have data for previous years, you can add that in as well. So you'll get your year on year comparisons. And obviously, the more you use five, that will keep carrying forward. And you've got all that information in here. Okay, so you can see it's pulled it all through for me because I'm in receipts and payments. My box seven and my box eight figures are the same. So if this was the year end, this would be my final bank rec. And box seven is therefore the same. So it's pulling all that information, putting it in there for me. It's pulled through my total asset figure from the asset register we just looked at. And it's pulled through my outstanding loan and the borrowings list we looked at as well. Okay, so that all that information is there, ready to go. I can select not to show the pencil up on the top left here, and it will literally look like it would do for putting in the format for the auditor. Okay, once that's done, you can then copy all that information over into the new financial year. That will remember everything. So you have your prior year. And you'll also have your opening balances ready to start in the financial year as well. So once you've got all the information in, you've run this, you've checked that you're happy with it, you can then just keep moving it forward each financial year so that it keeps rolling on. The closing balance becomes your opening balance. Okay. If I was working in income and expenditure, I'd see a few more options in here. So we'll just have a look at that briefly. So as I said, if you show income expenditure, you'll see the additional menu options for working in here. Okay, so we've had asset register and borrowings as we talked about, but this will now allow you to put the adjustments in. So this is what I was talking about earlier, where you come and put in your accruals for items that you've not yet paid for. You could be pay items, etc. So I have one here for somebody cleared the hedge at the end of March for £2,000. I've not yet paid that invoice. I want to adjust for it. And I've also got £323 worth of allotment fees not paid for this year. So I therefore want to adjust for that. And increase my income okay so once you've put your adjustments into scribe scribe will take all that information for you to update the annual return okay i'll just show you the working document that creates that in here hopefully you can see that it's come out quite small but what it will do is it will say these are the receipts and payments figures in scribe i'm going to adjust for any adjustments from last year i'm going to add any of the adjustments that we've just put in like the ones i've talked about there's that 323 for allotments and the 2000 pounds for the hedge clearance and then my final column is now my income and expenditure data that I'm going to use. So it takes all that information, adds on the relevant parts, reverses the last year's information in order to run the annual return for you. So you'll then see that information in here. What you'll then get 
is an annual return in here, which doesn't bounce because I'm in receipts and payments normally, but it would feed through for us in here. Okay, and it will also create a balance sheet. So if you want to see that information in here, you'll get that and it will balance for you. At the moment, mine's not been updated, but what it will do at year end is it will pull it all through. You'll see the endings of your bank balance and that information. And again, in the same way, you can copy over year on year and you've got all that, that information in there. Okay. And it also automatically creates reconcile between box seven and eight as well. So if you've got, once you've got to the year end and it's all in there exactly, you haven't got to come think about the figures that you've got in there, it'll automatically pull through. So there's our 322 pounds for allotments. Here's our 2000 pounds for hedge clearance. It all describe will also automatically work out your closing back position. So you don't need to do that. And it pulls it all through for that supporting documentation as well. Okay, hope there's a quick little <clears throat> showcase of that. I hope that's okay to cover everything. Thank you. Know. So um, it's a little quick uh, view on what how Scribe does year end. Um, it's kind of competition time now, and we kind of tie that in with a bit of an incentive to take a further demo of Scribe. So if anybody, if you want to enter the competition, we're going to do like a wheel of fortune for this bottle of gin. So if, you, if you'd like to enter the competition, you've got to take a demo of Scribe. And the way to do that is to say yes in the chat. If you say yes in the chat, we'll, we'll enter you for the competition. And also we'll get in touch afterwards. Uh, Mel will be in touch afterwards to give you a full demo of Scribe. So, right, we've got a head on in, fantastic. Um, and so great, Jenny's coming in. Um, let me just tell you a little about Scribe where everyone's popping in. So we've got, yeah, the gin is getting more competitive, it seems. Um, so someone did mention in the chat about GDPR. So we, we, still call it, we still call it GDPR because everyone kind of knows what it is, but technically speaking, it is a um, UK data protection law, but the, the law is the same as the, the EU data protection law. Um, so that's kind of, we, we still refer to it as GDPR, but strictly speaking, it's a different law in the UK, but it's the same rules. Um, uh, um, we've also, if you, we've showed you a little bit of Scribe accounts. Also, um, we've got Scribe booking system where you can view a village and town halls, tennis courts, and so on. You can take online bookings by credit card and manage the whole thing. We can also show you a demo of that. So if you want to see that, just type in yes as well. We've got a symmetry management system that integrates into accounts as well, like the booking system does, where you've got um, a map where you can put all your plots on there and a database behind, again, compliant with records keeping and GDPR. And so I think we are, yeah, and I, I think it's looking at the chat here, we've got a few people saying they're already Stripe customers. Of course, if you want to enter the competition, then please just say yes. And we'll let you in. We'll let you in. Okay. We'll and in there as well. Yeah, what, put Hannah in there, Hannah Driver. Yeah, we'll add you in. <laughs> we all know you like your gin. So, okay. I'm nearly there. I think I put everyone in. Getting there, we're getting there. Yeah. Um, just to give you a quick uh, sort of view of how Scribe's going to develop over the next year as well. Um, we've now got four in our support team. Hannah is our kind of our, the brains behind the, the product and also the, the accounting, you see from her knowledge. Um, we don't always get everything right. We try and learn from our community, but we get a lot of things right. And the system's online. And a part of the, the, the benefit of, of being a Scribe customer is you not only get the system, but you get access to our front level support, which hopefully people answer stuff um, by email, on the phone or in the groups. Facebook groups, um, but things if things get escalated, then they end up with Hannah or with Jane, who can help you out. So um, yeah, there's, there's a way through. And our plan this year is we've got the product roadmap is we will be adding in payroll um, in the next few months. We will also be adding in a live bank feed into Scribe in the next few months. Um, towards the, the middle of the year, we'll be adding more advanced features for income and expenditure account, um, councils to make that better. And our plan over the next few years is to build out our product set to make them better and better for you. So we always like the feedback um, and we always want to hear from our customers. And we, we're great. We love to have all the feedback. And uh, we know we do lots of these Zooms to get that. Hannah, are we nearly there with the Wheel of Fortune? Yeah, I'm typing as quick as I can. I think it's been going crazy. Um, <laughs> just, yeah, so I think just finally to say, we will be having it. We had last year, we had a very successful Scribe Fest, which was like this, but um, a much bigger sort of half day sessions with all sorts of things from website compliance to um, well-being and so on. And this year we will also be doing another Scribe Fest. So make sure you keep an eye on your emails for us. Um, we'll be emailing when that comes through. Anna, are we good to go for the comp? We are good to go. So, so let me share my the screen. Wheel of Fortune, who's going to win? Hopefully me. And me. I haven't rigged it, I promise. <laughs> <laughs> uh, there we go. Here it comes. Who's going to be the right. winner? Here we go. 
Scratch in. Here we go. Spin the wheel. Who's it going to be? The music. Is that your choice, Anna? I think that was Mel's choice. <laughs> Martin. Martin, it looks like it's Martin. Is it going to Joe? It's Martin. Congrats, Martin. We've got uh, we've got your email, so Hannah will be in touch afterwards to get yeah. your address, and the, the, the gin will be on the way to you. So, um, I think that kind of brings us to the end of the end of the session. So, I just want to thank first of all Hannah, other Hannah, for all her information and so on. I uh, want to thank other Hannah for managing everything. Mel, thanks for coming in and, and, and introducing. Uh, but most of all, I want to thank uh, all our lovely customers who support us and, and backed us over the years. Um, and we look forward to working with you in the future. And thank you all for everyone who's attended and um, we appreciate you know, coming in, spending your time with us and wish you all the best getting out of lockdown and hopefully uh, open soon <laughs> and uh, summer will be better. So on that note, guys, have a great day. Take care. Thanks, everyone. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye. Bye.